Chapter 311 The Enslaved Bride, Part 8 Brother Tia was like the first man, Adam, when God created him out of the earth. He had no father, mother, wife, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins, grandparents, or relatives. He had no friends either. At least for Adam, God later on made his wife, Eve, but Tia had no one belonged to. While he was growing up, he picked up some local dialogues, which added to the confusion. His mother could be an African woman and his father an Arab man, she could also be an African woman and the man who impregnated her, an African, or an Arab woman with an African man. The last combination was highly improbable, because in a strongly racist society, such as Sudan, a union of this sort happened only rarely, if ever. With no known relatives or parents, it was difficult to discover Tia's place or family of origin. Who named him? How and where was he born? Tia's earliest childhood memories were of fending for himself. If Tia had no parents or relatives, then how did he come to the world and who named him Tia? To answer this question precisely we need to go back to his childhood days. Tia found himself growing in the streets, like a stray dog that cast away by his owner. He survived the early years by begging. When his hands and legs became strong enough, he started delivering items to people. He made very little money with that hard labor. Very often bigger urchins robbed the petty cash Tia earned. Nature taught Tia to fight for survival. He learned that it was not enough to beg and work, but that he must also fight those who liked to make easy money. Unfortunately, as he got a little bigger, Tia also learned some bad habits. He was not guided by any code of ethics, having had no religious upbringing. He was neither Muslim, nor Christian, nor even African animist. He was a totally irreligious person. Until he became an adult, he did not even know the meaning of the word God. Later on in the course of his life, he discovered that it was an important social status to belong to a religion and from then on claimed to be a Muslim. Nevertheless, Tia never learned the rules of Islam and had never prayed in his entire life. The first social law Tia had learned earlier in his life was that, might is right. Necessity taught him to fight for his survival during his time out in the streets. By the strength of his hands Tia earned his living. He beat younger urchins and stole their food, cash, and whatever little things they had. Of course, he paid the price for that. Because he was little at the time, the policeman would catch him whenever he did mischief and flog him on the spot. Other gentlemen of society would do the same thing whenever they saw Tia beating other homeless kids. It was an expected and an acceptable behavior in that society for any man to slap, kick, or flog any child he judged as not behaving properly. However, no one could remain a child forever. Tia did not live in Neverland, where children remain young forever, and fly like birds. Therefore, Tia grew against his wishes, arriving at the next stage of his life. As the existentialists said, Tia was thrown into the world and required to make a man out of himself. Because he lacked any moral upbringing, Tia grew into a criminal. He started out his adulthood by stealing, pickpocketing, and cheating people. Later on, he also engaged in burglary and armed robbery. Committing armed robbery placed him in serious trouble with the law. The policeman ambushed him one night in a dark and deserted place and arrested him. Tia had been arrested several times before, for smaller crimes. In each case he served time in prison for a few months or a year at the most. Sometimes, he also got scourged for stealing things. When he was arrested for armed robbery, the judge took his case seriously and sentenced him to a long-term imprisonment. Those fourteen years he spent in jail ended up being the best years of his life. Tia was sent to Shula Central Prison in Nyala City. Shula Jail was created by the central government in Khartoum, in order to get rid of the notorious criminals who escaped the death penalty, or the rival politicians who caused trouble to its permanence. Most of the governments in Muslim, Arab, 
or African countries remained in power as long as they could control their rival politicians. Shula prison was made for bad citizens like Tia. When Tia appeared before the judge of the criminal court, he was tried as an adult, even though he was just an adolescent. He would always remember those moments, standing before the judge. What is your name? asked the judge harshly. I do not have a name sir, answered Tia truthfully. The judge frowned. How come you do not have a name? Even dogs in this country have names. Tia swallowed hard. Some people call me Wad al Shaitan, the son of Satan, and other people call me Wad al Haram, the bastard child, and I do not like either name. The judge looked at Tia for a while and said, From today onward, your name is Tia. The judge gave Tia that name because he reminded him of a notorious criminal by that name, whom he had sentenced to hanging a few years previously. That deceased criminal looked like a twin of Tia. In this way, Tia received his first official name. How old are you? continued the judge his interrogation. Tia shrugged. He did not know how to answer, because he had no birth certificate to show the judge to convince him that he was minor. After a moment of thought, he answered, I do not know sir. The judge hammered his gavel on the desk and spoke his final words. I sentence you to fourteen years of imprisonment in Chilla jail under hard labor. Tia was surprised, for this was the maximum penalty he could be given for his crime. He did not know that the judge's preference would have been to kill him, but his crime did not deserve the death penalty. Only murderers, rival politicians and religious apostates were given the death sentence and hung. Instead, the judge sent him to Shula like some other unlucky prisoners, where he hoped Tia would die before he completed even half of his fourteen-year term. In reality, Shula was not even a prison. It was a heavily secured area where the worst criminals were kept. It had no rooms or cells. The prisoners had no roofs over their heads, and had to protect themselves somehow from the blazing sun of Africa. They used their own clothes to protect their heads from the heat during the day and the cold during the night. Besides that, they had to keep themselves protected from scorpions and snakes. Flies and mosquitoes were the least of the many problems they had to face each day and each night. During the heavy raining season, the inmates had to use their uniforms as umbrellas. All of these hardships were nothing compared to the human beasts that Tia had to fight with in order to survive in Shula. If a prisoner could not fight for his food then he would starve to death. Again, the law of nature, survival of the fittest, was the only law inapplicable to life in Shula Central Prison. A person might survive fighting a battle-hardened gladiators in the Roman Colosseum, but not in Shula. He might also prevail against hungry lions in the Roman Flavian Amphitheatre, but not in that notorious Sudanese prison. Nevertheless, Tia was gifted by nature with a strong body rippling with muscles. In fact, every inch of Tia's short body was covered with muscles, even his cheeks, lips, nose and ears were muscular. Many notorious criminals tried to kill or defeat Tia in his first few days in Chula, but they could not. Within a short time Tia earned the title of the indestructible man. By the strength of his muscles, Tia was able to survive in Chula until he completed his fourteen years. Those years taught him a lesson he never forgot, and that was why they were the best years of his life. Whatever else might happen to him, Tia vowed never to return to Shula jail again. Wherefore, when he finally released from that dungeon, he began to look for a lawful means to earn his living. Because Tia had no schooling or any work experience, no one was ready to employ him. Besides that, people could see the effects of his criminal life written all over his face. When all possible doors were closed in his face, our brother Tia decided to become a bar milo. A bar milo is a government job, which is paid by the municipality. Nevertheless, in Sudan a woman would rather choose to work as a prostitute and a man as a slave than to be a bar milo. The job required the worker to participate in the sanitation of the city. It was not a simple cleaning job or merely sweeping the streets. Anyone in need could clean or sweep, 
but very few people would willingly agree to become Baramilos. In fact, 99% of the citizens of Sudan would rather starve to death than do that kind of work. It would be hard to write a job description for a Baramilo in a few sentences, but the government could put up with any kind of strike except that of the Baramilos. If Baramilos had a strong union, which would be unlikely, and that union called for a strike, then the entire city would turn into a public cesspool. This gives one an idea of what kind of social work the Baramilos rendered to the city. It also became clear that no other social work was so important to the society than that of Baramilos. Although the nature of the Baramilos' work is more clear it would be difficult for anyone who had not lived in a place where such a job was performed by human beings to fully understand how the work was carried out. The human waste had to be carried out of the city, poured out and buried somewhere in the wilderness. How could such an operation be performed by people? Suffice it to say that Bar Milo was a job and an art. If the worker did not master the job well, he could be killed or badly injured. Bar Milos had to do their job either at late night or early in the morning, for fine ladies in society and gentlemen of the city did not wish to see Bar Milos or to come close to them. So, Bar Milos, like the untouchables in a Hindu society, were not allowed to appear during the day. In India the Brahmins could not tolerate the untouchables defile them by stepping on their shadows. Like the bats, the untouchables had to come out of their slums at night and search for their food. In Sudanese society, a bar Milo had no such defiling element inherited through his karma, but no one could stand the nasty odour that was generated when he performed his duty. Even dogs did not dare to come close to bar Milos. All in all, it was an unenviable job. Baramilos used tractors to perform their duties. The tractor was connected to a long trailer, which was like a compartment in a cargo train. The trailer carried a huge container such as those used to transfer flammable substances like gas or fuel. If the tractor ever broke or if its container ever exploded, the inhabitants of that area would have had to desert their dwelling places forever. Even animals and insects would not survive in that place again. It would be as if a nuclear bomb had hit the city. Luckily until the present, no such disaster had been reported in any city of Sudan. Only the driver and two workers were allowed on the tractor. The driver steered the tractor, and the two workers filled up the container. They stood on top of the container like snipers. Their main task was to receive pails full of the disgusting sewage, which they would then pour into the container. Over 30 other workers ran behind the tractor and performed three different tasks. Their tasks were divided into three sections. Ten workers ran to residences alongside the tractor, and opened toilets to remove the waste buckets. Each bucket was as heavy as a barrel, which in Arabic is called a barmil, hence the name of the workers. By the way, Baramilos got their names from those barrels. Those buckets were called bar mills, which means barrels. A man of normal size would not normally be able to carry one of those barrels, even if it was empty. The second set of ten workers carried the barrels on their heads, returned to the tractor and hand them over to the two snipers who would shoot them into the container. As soon as the snipers emptied the barrels, they tossed them into the air. They never worried about either in which position the barrel landed, or over which head it fell. Very often the snipers did not empty the bucket fully. The remaining sludge would be spray all over the ground, filling the air with a pungent, nasty odor. It was the duty of the third set of ten bar milos to collect those scattered buckets and replace them back in the toilets from which they were taken. But not all bar milos in Sudan had the privilege of a tractor, a trailer, and a container. In small towns and villages, the Baramilos carried the buckets over their heads at night and walked for a long distance to a location outside of the town or village. Then, like people carrying a dead body in a funeral, they bury the human waste in a big hole in the wilderness. Because of the nature of the job of the Baramilos, it would help to understand how the toilet was built in Sudan. It was a small shack or hut built in a 1 meter by 1 meter square area. 
Each house had two of these toilets one for men and one for women. A small platform made of wood or concrete was made in the middle of the square. One could climb up to this platform with a two-step ladder. In the center of the platform there was a small circular hole. The hole was a little bigger than a rat hole, and a little smaller than a rabbit warren. It was big enough for its purpose. Beneath the circle was the bucket. The bar Milo could take out and replace the bucket through a small door made especially for him. No other mortal being was expected to come near those toilets and touch those buckets except for the bar Milos. If anyone other than bar Milos was seen near those toilets, the men of that house would kill him on the spot and his blood would be upon his head. This also was one of the honor killings in Sudan for which the law would not punish the killer. Although Tia hated his new job, he had no other alternatives. A year had now passed since he became a bar Milo. During this year he had mastered his job well and became used to it. It did not take long for Tia to lose his sense of smell. His co-workers also warned him that the job put him at a high risk of contracting a chronic disease. So far, Tia had stayed healthy, his years in Chilla had probably given him immunity to every kind of disease. Tia had no social life outside of his work, which was the only time of day when he could mix with other human beings without being avoided. Now people were not only scared of him as a dangerous criminal, but also avoided socializing with him due to the terrible smell that followed him like a shadow wherever he went. A bar Milo among humans like a skunk with the ability to spray a liquid with a strong unpleasant smell. No soap or perfume could free him from that nasty odor. Tia had no wife or girlfriend previously, nor was he likely to have one now. He had neither friend nor neighbor. He built his own hut by hand. He collected wood, broken boxes, grass, metal, and other scraps to set up his own shelter. His small hut had no fencing, door, or windows. It was just a roof without walls and that was much better than Chilla. Tia could not afford to keep a dog to guard his hut in his absence. He too scared that the dog might eat him up due to hunger. His hut was located at the end of the city. Tia and other outcasts lived beyond Bit al Zabir's prostitution and slavery camps. Even the prostitutes refused to grant Tia access to them, even though he was prepared to pay the charge. His work began at 10 p.m. and ended at 5 a.m. When people went to work, Tia returned home. He had adjusted to earning his living at any time of the day during his childhood, and had followed the same course of life in his bad days of burglary and armed robbery. Because he had always earned his living at night and slept during the day, some of his street followers in his youth had nicknamed him Wad al Shaitan or the son of Satan the Devil. Of course the judge had changed that bad name, and when Tia had come out of jail, he had decided to keep his new name. Tia had no way of entertaining himself. He had no TV, radio, or tape recorder. If someone had told Tia that the computer was the name of a new prophet who had appeared in Japan, he would have believed him. Imagine, then, his surprise at the chain of events, which began in his life one day. On that fateful day, as Tia was returning home from his night shift, he saw a young couple standing in front of his hut. At first he thought either the couple were strangers in the city and had lost their way or else he had lost his senses and had begun to imagine things that were not real. He slapped his face to make sure that he was not imagining the face of the beautiful girl who was smiling at him. No one had ever showed affection to Tia before. For the first time he was being acknowledged as a human being and like anyone else, he did have a heart that could respond to tenderness. He made a gesture with his hand as a response to the charming smile of the beautiful girl. Hello brother, said the girl, still smiling. Then, she offered her hand to him. Tia did not reply, but stretched out his rough hand, and held the delicate, soft hand of the girl. My name is Olivia, and this is my husband Malwal, said the girl gesturing to the man beside her. His throat was dry when he answered, My name is Tia. We are visitors, continued Olivia, her charming smile still decorating her beautiful lips. 
Tia did not know what a person should do with visitors, because he had none before. He kept staring at Olivia and Malwal. Olivia relieved the awkwardness of the moment by saying, Can we go inside your house? Tia led the way into his small cave. Since he had no chairs or a bed, he sat on the ground and requested his guests to sit as well. Why were these people here? He soon found out. We have come to offer you a golden opportunity, said Olivia. The expression on Tia's face revealed to Olivia that he had not understood what she had said. She rephrased her words. I mean to say we have come to offer you a deal. What deal, responded Tia fearfully. During his stay in jail, he had learned that the word deal meant to kill for someone else and get paid for it. If that was what they had come to offer him, Tia had no desire to go back to Shala. It is not a bad deal, said Malwal, speaking for the first time. Olivia nodded in agreement. Yes, Malwal is right, it is not a bad deal. We are good citizens like you. Tia was still uncertain. He asked them, what is your deal then? Olivia continued her explanation. We saw you somewhere in the city, and we knew you must be a hard-working person. We would like to help you earn some extra cash, if you will agree to do a small job for us. What is your job? Tia asked, becoming less fearful and more curious, and how much will I get if I do it for you? We will pay you one million Sudanese pounds. Our payment will be in cash, said Malwal. Even if Tia were to continue working as a bar Milo for the rest of his life, he would not make one percent of that amount. With one million pounds, he could be reborn as another human being in a different life and in a higher caste. With that money he could abandon his filthy work, immigrate to another city, start a fresh clean life, marry a woman, have children, and when he died, his children would carry his name with pride. This is like the story of the hasty man, who built castles in the air before he sold his bottle of ghee. After building all those fancies in his imagination, the hasty man mistook his bottle of ghee for his disobedient son, whom he had not yet given birth to, and instead of the bad son, he hit the bottle with his stick and spilled the ghee. That day, Tia went through the same stages, but luckily, he had no rod in his hand to hit one of his visitors. If your deal will not put me in trouble, with the police, I am ready to accept it," said Tia, after a long silence. I swear by the pupils of my eyes, said Olivia while placing two of her right hand's fingers near her beautiful eyes, that our deal has nothing to do with the police. We have come to you because no one else can do this job. Why only me? Tia's eyes narrowed with suspicion. Because your work as a bar Milo gives you the golden opportunity to earn a million pounds overnight, said Malwal, smiling. Olivia explained what Tia had to do for them, and he gladly accepted the deal.